change to the schedule now on BBC One Northern Ireland due to recent events in the Middle East. Shalom Belfast will be shown at a later date. Instead, we have the story of Mackie's now, as told by the family and the workers. You had a laugh together, you worked together, you made your mistakes together. Those times I could have run a mile to get out of it. But looking back on it, I got a living out of it. True Belfast men and women worked in Mackey's and we had a lot of laughs. We had some sad moments too. There was that ethos in the place that you were part of something and you belonged to something and most people felt committed to doing a good job in the place. The people who worked with the company were the company. I didn't regard them as working for me they were working with me. Ulster's heavy industries have buttressed the Allied war effort since September 1939. In the gun room of this famous Ulster machine shop, more than 20 six-pounder anti-tank guns are produced every week. Many types of guns and ammunition are now made at this great plant. Anti-tank guns... Anti -tank James Mackey and Sons was a Belfast engineering company with a name for building machines that were practically unbreakable. For the thousands of men and women who worked there, they simply knew the place as Mackey's. In the First and Second World Wars, Mackey workers stepped up to the plate and turned their skills to making weapons. But in more peaceful times, Mackey's was the world's leading builder of textile machinery. Mackie machines were shipped to places as far flung as Cuba and India. Many of them are still working today, up to 70 years later. The man behind the Mackie Empire, James Mackie Sr., is buried in Belfast City Cemetery. He came from a humble background in Dumfries in Scotland. In the 1840s, James travelled to Ireland to work as a fitter in Drogheda. When that job finished, he moved to Belfast to work in an iron foundry on Albert Street. Ten years later, he owned the place. He started off with a wheelbarrow going round all the mills and collecting what we called a flyer. And the flyer is a bent piece of steel that spins the, the yarn onto the bobbin. So he would collect those in the wheelbarrow and bring them home with him to the Albert Street and get them repaired and uh, then wheel them back to the mills and deliver them again. So that, that's how he started off with about four employees. James Mackey arrived in Belfast as the city was going through an industrial revolution. And at its heart was the linen industry. He steadily built up the family business by supplying machinery to the big linen mills of Belfast. When his son, James Jr., joined the firm, he took on the job of expanding Mackey's into new markets beyond Ireland. When he and his brother Tom finally took over the company, James Mackey Jr. became affectionately known as the boss. He started work at the age of 14, helping his father. We're talking about the 1880s. Anyway, he uh, was really the man responsible for taking on the sales side of the business, not just in Northern Ireland, where he sold flax machinery, but also into Europe. And that eventually grew to cover the rest of the world. There you are, and there's the boss stroking one of your dogs, a dachshund, and there's your father. After the boss and his brother took over the company, they brought the next generation of Mackies in to help run the business, at home and abroad. The boss's youngest son became part of the international sales team, and it was on a trip to Germany that young Lavin's Mackie met the love of his life, Marion Dorndorf. They were married in Silesia in 1929. Mother went into her home because it was impossible to look after her with a nurse 24 hours a day here. One of the family at least tried to be in every day to see her and show her pictures or 
go through her wedding video with her and keep her entertained. But I'm afraid she's slowly winding down now. Well, after 103, she's lucky to be able to wind down. What happened to Mitzi and Fritzi? Well, we're, they're not living in Vienna. Yeah, and what happened to them? Mm-hmm. Well, well, Mitzi and Fritzi were two of your bridesmaids, weren't they? Mother was the daughter of a large shoe manufacturer called Dorndorf. They already had a chain of shops in Germany before the First World War to sell their goods, and they had a very large factory. So father was out selling them more machinery to make more stitching thread for shoes. And there was a big dam sold in in honour of my father, and mother was one of the ladies at the age of 19, invited to the dance. And mother always maintained, she took one look at him and said, oh, that mad Irishman, no way. So anyhow, a year later, they got married. And mother came over straight away to Northern Ireland. The Emerald Isle, Isle of blue lakes and kindly hills, whose soft green slopes roll down to the sea. As summer wanes and harvest approaches, old and young join in garnering the precious crop. But in these fields there is no hum of mechanical reaper. Simple though it appears, the pulling and tying of flax is a job for practised hands alone. Just ten years after the new Mrs. Marion Mackey came to Northern Ireland, Britain was at war with her native Germany. The linen produced by Mackey machines was now used to fit out aircraft. As the men went to the front, the company took on a majority female workforce to make munitions. The variety of shells, uh, projectiles, bombs, was huge. I believe the figure is something like 72 million shells or shell components. And many of them were armor piercing. For textile machinery, we used tungsten carbide as a very hard wearing metal to stop the yarns cutting through the the metal as they ran over it. And that metal is hard to work and we had the technology to work it. And so it was incorporated into the shell so that when it struck the tank, the impact cracked the tank armor open and allowed the molten metal to flow through into the tank and kill the people inside. From shells, we went on to make aircraft. We make short starting bomber fuselages and we made a a wide variety of other ornaments. The Bofors gun was a a light anti-aircraft gun, 40 millimeter ammunition, brought in during the Second World War. The relation to Mackey's is Mackey's made the shells and the warheads for the gun. The gun was used in the Battle of El Alamein when people from the local uh, light anti-aircraft batteries went across and fought under a very famous Ulster man, Bernard Montgomery, and helped to defeat Rommel in the desert. The, the weapon is also used during the Belfast Blitz. Winston Churchill uh, cabled Belfast, thanking the people of Belfast, particularly the employees and workers of Mackey's, for their contribution for that war effort. Churchill's letter to the people of Northern Ireland is one the Mackey family and workforce cherish. Without them, as Churchill said at the time, the light which now shines throughout the world would have been quenched. Welcome to this exhibition on James Mackey and Sons, which is as far as West Belfast, or indeed Belfast, is concerned. This was the greatest story never told. We are lucky enough to have some of the Mackey family here, but at the end of the day, anybody who had a relation or came through the Mackey system itself is part of the extended family. You mightn't like it, but that's the way it is. Sam was the cleaner first. That's the name. That was editor of that. At that time. We're wearing the pearls in the red. I stole a mind of bliss. One girl, one boy, some dream. 
some joy. The exhibition is a reflection on the mate of the Mackey factory throughout this area and beyond. This is the Spectrum Centre and we're just at the junction of where the men from this area put them down Lombard Avenue, onto Cooper Street and made their way to Albert Friend. It's amazing when you look at that, you see, you can see the size of the whole complex. It makes you realise how many different things that, that Mackies were involved in making. The first thing that struck me was the size of the place. There was hammering, chiseling, drilling, different noise. It was a completely awe-inspiring environment because I was just fresh out of school and I felt, oh my goodness, what have I let myself in for? On the Monday, the 16th of October, 1949, I walked up that path for the first time with my new linens on, my new overall. I thought I was cutting quite a dash <laughs> till I got into the end of the place and realized there was lots of people cutting quite a dash. When I started, you were allowed seven minutes in the morning and seven minutes in the afternoon. Now, I don't know what would have happened if you, were, you had a visit the toilet after that, but there was a, a man, a clerk, known by other names, that looked after each toilet, and he took your check number when you went in and timed you. And he wrote it in a book, and he slipped two wee bits of toilet paper in below the door, and you were allowed seven minutes. If you stayed on more than seven minutes, he pulled it in. You know? <laughs> This is the view from Mackey's Bistro and the Farset Hostel on the Springfield Road. And here laid out in front is Springfield Dam. Now the Springfield Dam is one of the best known landmarks in West Belfast and in the Springfield. The far bank was covered at one time by the entire length and breadth of the Albert Foundry. This was the industrial heartland of the Springfield Road. In peacetime, Mackey's employed up to 7,000 people, mainly men. Its West Belfast site was really impressive. 133 acres in total, with a staggering 1.3 million square feet under cover. This is a photograph we decided to take for the, um, for the radius. And um, if you take the photograph, I, I was a pilot at that time. Now I took uh, the Oster aircraft, which is a high, high wing, uh, and that meant you could take the door off. And we got the works photographer called Jimmy Taylor, uh, and he laid out the window out where the door should be uh, and it's because of the problems um, in Belfast we are only allowed to fly at 500 feet but I think I came down to around about 300 feet to uh, get this photograph. So you show first of all the front of the uh, buildings on the uh, Springfield Road and this was the office block and then it moves down into the iron foundry which was doing all the casting work the erection shops and also the transport department was uh, around here and uh, then down to uh, jute mill uh, and then the west factory up here where we set the training school up in over here we come to the albert foundry welfare and recreation ground called uh, paisley park which was a after peter paisley not the reverend paisley out of our wages in maggie's there was a, a remuneration took every week and that remuneration went towards charity and also to welfare, which also maintained the upkeep of the complex here, which as well as having the bowling club, had also the football club and the boxing club. But having said that, it would have been very difficult maybe for an ordinary employee to become a member of the bowling club, because in the early days, membership was really for foremen, managers and staff other than workers on the shop floor. But that changed in later years. You got a little brass disc with a number on it, and that was your number. When you went in the morning, you put the brass disc into a box, and you used that all week. Now, on a Friday afternoon, you would have got two discs, a silver disc and your brass disc. You got your silver disc, and you produced that for your wages. 
I can remember exactly what my first pay was. In fact, I still have the little chit in the house even yet. It was two pounds, 16 shillings and ninepence for the week. And I remember coming home and the brown envelope, I gave it to my mum. You were allowed three late mornings in the month, 15 minutes. If you used half an hour, that counted as two. And after that, if you were late, you, you just didn't get in. Now, there was the, the horn went two minutes before the starting time, and then there was the second horn, that was you started. But when the first horn went, the gates were closed over and there was just a narrow gap left. But I, I had seen people in Woodville, when the second horn went, getting pushed back out. And they lost a day's pay. So you never be late. Mackey's had a bonus system so that men could earn more money. But compared to places like the shipyard and shorts, basic pay was low. To balance out the fact that the wages maybe were not the best, you always had the feeling that if you were working there, there was a job for life. Uh, it was a safe place to work in as far as uh, the prospects of, of unemployment were concerned. And there was always that feeling that unless you really did something outrageously bad, you were there for life if you wanted to be. Well, the company had 20 very successful years from the end of the war right through until the late 1960s. It was based primarily on jute machinery, although there were huge amounts of flax spinning machinery, synthetic fiber spinning machinery, sisal spinning machinery, all supplied during the same period. So the company employment built up to about 7,000 people, and their peak rate of production was 100 spinning frames a month. And you have to bear in mind that the, the company started a jute machinery building company in Calcutta in 1954. It must have been one of the very first companies in Western Europe to put a manufacturing subsidiary for engineering products in India. The Mackey family sold machinery all over the world, not just in India. Their machines were bought in South America, Africa, the Middle East, and all over Asia, in places like Burma, Cambodia, and China. Teams of Belfast fitters and engineers traveled the world installing Mackey design machines. My life in Mackey's was very varied. I started in 1945 as an apprentice. Then I became an installation engineer and was sent to Dundee, and uh, from that to various countries in the continent of Europe. And then in 1954, I was sent out to Calcutta uh, to uh, become uh, not only a member of the sales staff, but also initially a director and subsequently a joint managing director of the local company called the Legend Jute Machinery Company. At the same time, in Calcutta, there were 112 jute mill plants lined along the banks of the Hooghly River. Now, our sales staff in Calcutta had increased, so we put up four luxury apartments. I had the butler or bearer, I had a cook, I had a jimmadar to do the cleaning of the floor, I had a doobie to do the washing of the clothes, I had, of course, my chauffeur. There was also a Derwin to guard the premises. He was a security man and a, a Mali to look after the garden. And indeed, uh, it was quite amusing to me because in the morning I would leave the apartment and Swami would follow me with the newspaper and the briefcase. And uh, my driver uh, would be standing with the door open and salute me and say, good morning, sir. And uh, I'd say, good morning to mine. And I, I, I had to refrain from laughing it was because I, <laughs> I wasn't accustomed to that. But I soon got very used to it. So we had a very privileged life. This wouldn't 
happened if it wasn't for Stanley, who was organising the thing and brought people together. There's something about Mackey's. It was the spirit of work, the work ethics. And uh, that cemented people together in a very, very special way. And uh, I feel kind of humbled to be here as one of the few of the Mackey family left. This is the eighth annual dinner. We call it the Mackey Old Boys Club. There are quite a number here who were out in India and in the Far East, and I was their boss. And now they can come together and talk about their experiences and have a few drinks and enjoy a meal. It's not Mackey, it's Mackey's. Without them, none of us would be anywhere. We live for Mackey's, and Mackey's as such taught us and looked after you, and you knew everyone from day one. You went forward together. There were very few people who, with any capabilities, who stayed where they were. It was an advancement, it was a push. It's the family. My father was a fitter in the press and tools. He reared his family through Mackey's. I had an Uncle Andy in the machine shops, an Uncle Jim in the machine shops, my Uncle Tommy in the molten shop, and my Uncle Billy, who was a foreman in the molten shop, and they all reared their families through Mackey's. This is a scale model of a sailor spread machine. It gives everybody an idea of the many thousands and thousands of parts that went in to build a Mackey machine. The tolerances involved were unbelievable. The joke or the story that used to go between the shipyard men and Mackey's men. Shipyard men that worked within a thousandth of an inch. Mackey men, they had a bit of on. I remember when my first week, uh, my, my boss got one of my colleagues to show me around the place, give me a tour of it. And I remember him taking me through the iron foundry and being absolutely terrified of this place. There were, the, the heat in it was, was awful. Uh, there were these large containers of white hot metal uh, moving on an overhead system uh, and the, some of the metal was spilling out over the edges onto the ground beneath. I remember thinking to myself, I'll never be in here again if I have anything to do with it. One day I was standing at the door of the foundry and my old foreman came past and he said to me, that's an evil place Billy you're working in. <laughs> when he looked in and saw the metal being poured. So I sort of agreed with him at the time. I was employed as a translator in Mackey's from 1983 to 1991. Um, I did mainly Spanish and Portuguese. I also helped out with French and Italian. Your vocabulary books were your Bible. If you lost your vocabulary books, you were in deep trouble because they most definitely were not the type of vocabulary that we used um, in our studies at university. For example, uh, a drawing frame. In my naivety, I thought a drawing frame, if I just looked up the dictionary and not thought about it, I might have picked something that an artist might have used uh, to draw on or to lean on. But I was taken down to the works to be shown what a drawing frame was, and it actually would have filled, you know, the, something the size of an aircraft hangar. Maggie's was famous for a whole lot of things. All the textile machinery in the world that they had built but were also famous for these. Homers. They done frontons, pokers, shovels. As a boy, I thought there was two kinds of paint in the world, and only two kinds: black and Mackey's green. When the Northern Ireland Trouble started in the late 60s, Mackey's found itself in the front line. A number of its workers were shot. It had to increase its own security measures, and there were days when getting to and from work could be life-threatening. I can remember vividly uh, going into work on Maggie's on what turned out to be the morning in which internment was introduced, and managing to make my way in, into work to discover that there were very few people had done so, and then one of the directors had managed to get in. He came and said, look, the army want you out of the place and we went to the front gate and there were two armoured personnel carriers sitting on the Springfield Road side by side and a few of us got in between them in the middle and they took off 
slowly together up the Springfield Road and every side street that they passed the bullets were coming and ricocheting off the outside of these these vehicles and we, we were walking up in between them. We were always looked on as a Protestant establishment and the problem then was at the beginning of the troubles we had uh, the gun shop and we had the automatic shop uh, so we had a big delegation from the locals uh, coming to s see what we were doing and we were making arms for the UVF and everyone else and I had to explain to them that the gun shop was for making uh, 25 pounder gun barrels and it had retained the name from the war even though it was now making rollers. Mackey's being on the Springfield Road was really very much at the centre of an area that suffered quite a lot during the Troubles and there was an occasion uh, where I was doing the leaf switchboard and a, a phone call came through to say there was a bomb in the building and we were always very well trained in Mackey's and the switchboard girls trained me very well and I actually thanked the caller for his call and then said to the, the girl Elner who did the switchboard full time, Elner I think that was uh, uh, somebody's ringing to say there's a bomb in the building. In 1975 my daughter was shot in the back on the Grosvenor Road on the way home from the pictures and they sent her to Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Buckinghamshire, you know, Aylesbury. And obviously we were going to have difficulty visiting her. Shortly after that happened, an envelope appeared on my desk. And when I opened it, it contained an airline ticket to London and 20 quid spending money. When I came back, another envelope appeared on my desk which contained another airline ticket and 40 quid spending money. So I got her home and uh, I got to thinking here we as a Catholic family were supported in this trouble by our Protestant friends from Mackey's majority would have been Protestant. When we set up in the Springfield Road, the Springfield Road was a Protestant area, uh, so quite obviously it became, uh, we were taking the labour force from nearby, so it was uh, predominantly Protestant at that time. But then they put in the uh, Clonard uh, Monastery, and the whole area changed, started to change from Protestant to Catholic. And uh, at the time of the Troubles, they were saying about uh, being a Protestant company, we did a survey in the company and I found that there was 28% um, um, Catholic and um, the rest were Protestant, uh, which uh, was exactly the same ratio as the Catholics and Protestants in Belfast. Clearly there were sectarian prejudices among the workforce. There's no way we could have altered that. And so that existed. But in terms of company policy, it was certainly not policy to have favour one side of the divide or the other. By the 1970s, Mackey's was in decline. Pay disputes, inflation and the arrival of synthetic fibres all took their toll. In a sense, we were victims of our own success. We had now modernised all of the industry that we were going to modernise. So the decline wasn't so much caused by a collapse in demand for the products which our machinery made, but the fact that the world was by then well stocked with the necessary machinery to make these products. Our products lasted so long that we were our own worst enemy. I still today see machines that were built 15, 60 years ago and they're still running. In 1976, the Mackey family put their shares into a trust and handed ownership over to the workers. Leslie and Gordon Mackey stayed as hands-on directors for a number of years. When the company went into partnership with the American manufacturer Loomis, that enterprise ended in failure. Next, a local entrepreneur, Pat Dugan, took over as chief executive. By now, the Mackey family had cut its ties with their great-grandfather's company. Mackey International moved to a new site and factory and in 1995 it received a Queen's Award for Export Achievement. The future looked bright.
Good morning, Jim. The president is making history here this morning as he becomes the first president ever to travel to Northern Ireland. This morning, the president is sitting down, Jim, with workers at a plant that employs both Catholics and Protestants to point out that it can work. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, accompanied by Patrick Dugan. In 1995, we had the presidential visit. Bill Clinton arrived on the 30th of November. He did his presidential address in the Mackey Complex, and it gave a buzz to West Belfast, Northern Ireland, and further afield. We had to build a covered walkway. That was to ensure that in the event of some incident taking place, that the president could be taken from the stage out this covered walkway without the chance of the world's press photographing anything that may have happened. This is one of those occasions where I really feel that uh, all that needs to be said has already been said. But the optimism was misplaced, and despite the injection of government cash, Mackey International finally closed in 1999. Parts of the company were sold as a going concern, and many of its assets were sold at auction by the receivers. It didn't come as any surprise, because things were starting to run down just at that particular time. I thought the writing was on the wall for the firm. That was a sad time, because the best of men lost their jobs. When Mackey International finally went out of business, Part of it was bought by Bridge Textile, a Galway company with experience in China. Bridge started a joint venture with a Mr. Fu Gudong from the Chinese company Golden Eagle. Golden Eagle opened an office at Molusk, where it now employs only four of the Mackey workforce to run its Belfast operation. A big part of their job is dealing worldwide in spare parts for old Mackey textile machines. That business went on for until 2005 uh, when Bridge Techside decided that they had enough of this business and that they wanted to sell the rest of their holding to Golden Eagle. Uh, at that time, we were all out of a job, so we had to discuss with Mr. Fu, the chairman of Golden Eagle, to maintain the Belfast office and to continue to operate as we did with Bridge Techside. <laughs> Mackey machines were and are so highly regarded in the textile world that the machines made in China still keep the Mackey name. Today, the Mackey Empire is alive and well in China, near the city of Denghai in the East China Sea. Denghai is four hours drive from Shanghai. It's on an island. It's a very safe city. As a foreigner, you can walk it from six o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock at night and nobody will bother you. Uh, and that is the first thing that strikes you. My father worked in Mackey's tool room for more than 50 years and it was always expected of me by the family that I would join him. So I joined Mackey's as an apprentice fitter in 1961 and went on my first assignment to Thailand and Cambodia in 1966. I joined the joint venture in 2001 and as a result visit China regularly. Golden Eagle is a large number of companies spread over 24 sites across six Chinese provinces. It employs 10,000 workers. Three of its factories are involved full time in the manufacture of Mackey textile machinery. The workers work from 8 in the morning until 4.30, five and sometimes six days a week. At the moment, the textile engineering division is working four nights extra overtime and every other Sunday uh, due to uh, demand for the Mackey machinery. On the biggest site, there are two Mackey machine shops manufacturing components for Mackey textile machinery and there are two erection shops. They have a spun silk factory 
a cashmere mill, a very large flax mill, which includes a spinning room with over 22,000 spindles, which by anybody's standards is very large indeed. On the same flex mill, they have a heckling room, which they're currently modernizing by introducing new Mackey technology. I admire the chairman of Golden Eagle, Mr. Fugu Dahl, in having the foresight and the business acumen to set up the joint venture in the first place in 1999 and then to buy out his partners in 2005. He put in place a young uh, team of Chinese graduates to support us in the marketing of the Mackey brand uh, around the world. visit the site of the original factory that was set up in 1999 to manufacture Mackie machinery in China. The name of the factory was Xinjiang Yinyang Mackie International Machinery Company Limited. The project was so successful that within a couple of years of it being set up, they had to move to a different site with more space available and that has continued to this day. The foundry is quite a small foundry employing about 100 people, approximately six kilometers from the old factory. Last year it produced 1,000 tonnes of grey cast iron. These are castings that uh, are used in the manufacture of Mackey jute machinery in particular. It reminds me of uh, the days when I, as a young apprentice, when I walked through the foundry to shelter from the rain outside, when I was walking to the top of the foundry yard, and invariably the molders would deliberately splash some molten metal and make me jump and run. Four years ago, Golden Eagle Mackey opened a brand new factory on the outskirts of Dinghai. It takes up 75 acres and 40 of those are under cover. On this site, the company makes spinning machines cards and Mackie spreaders. The complex machinery built here is due for export around the world. It was designed by people from Mackie's Belfast operation on the Springfield Road. Since the project started in 2001, we have exported approximately 4,000 machines for a total value of over 100 million US dollars. I was surprised to learn recently that Golden Eagle uh, because of the strength of the, the brand name of Mackey, have now decided to utilise the name on their garments. So in future, all jackets, blouses and shirts manufactured by Golden Eagle will carry the Mackey brand. When you look at the level of sales that we have achieved over the last 10 years, there is only one way of describing it, that this has been a very successful project. And at the basis of that success is the design of the Mackey machine. I'm very sure that my father and all the generations of people who worked in Mackey's over the years would be very proud that the machinery that they manufactured and designed in Belfast was still being manufactured in China. That programme replaced our build Shalom Belfast, which can now be seen at a later date. Next tonight, a new season on poverty begins with very different experiences of childbirth from around the world.